It's, I'm absolutely delighted um, to be able to welcome in an otherwise very quiet semester for the Saxena Center, Parasmita Singh. And it, Parasmita, kind of her work and she herself kind of defy easy classification, which is why is one of the many ex reasons why I'm particularly excited to have her here. She's a writer, she's an artist, an editor, and she has published across different forms, uh, graphic novels, uh, comics, as, uh, as, you, as the kind of title for today suggests. One of my favorites is the one that's up here right now, uh, the Hotel at the End of the World in 2009, a book ostensibly for children, but really all of us are children, um, Mara and, and the Clay Cows in 2015. Peace Has Come, a beautiful collection of short stories, uh, really incredible. I strongly recommend it for those of you who haven't seen it uh, in 2018. And the anthology Centerpiece, which is new writing and art from Northeast India. All of these books, uh, if you kind of wander out are on the table outside. So please feel free to just stop and take a look. And most of them, but not all, are available in the US. Uh, she also has a piece in a beautiful book that's also outside, which also has a piece by one of our professors, Holly Schaffer. Um, and it's called Old Stacks, New Leaves, and is a really beautiful publication. And so Parasmita comes to us today via UPenn, where this publication was launched. She's also the author of the NRC Sketchbook, which is a graphic reportage series and available online at the Huffington Post, and also has some really tremendously interesting blogs about fashion, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, in the voice of fashion. And her current projects include a grassroots community art project that produces children's book uh, for Pratham Education Foundation, which many of you might be aware of, and a graphic novel on the decolonization of museums. And I am just excited in to, to welcome you all to what is the first of a series of events that Parasmita will be involved with in the course of a week-long residency. And so we have today, on Thursday, we have the launch of a zine in the RISD library. Uh, we also have Parasmita joining Holly Schaffer's class on contemporary art in South Asia. And, you know, she'll also have an office in the Center for Contemporary South Asia for those of you who want to engage one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. But I am just really beyond delighted to introduce Parasmita Singh uh, into our milieu at Brown. So Parasmita, I'm going to welcome you, clap, and then maybe I'll let you come here so you can, we can just kind of go around the room and introduce ourselves. Um, and I'll say that, you know, we'll begin uh, Brigupati Singh, who is at Ashoka University, many of you might know in the anthropology department and also here at the Kani Center for Brain Sciences, will lead us off with some questions and we'll kind of have an open Q&A and then Parasmita will lead us into the workshop. You guys should all have, you know, supplies. And there'll be more. Okay, so Paras, why don't you join us here? And then we all just kind of introduce you. Oh, uh, my name is Prerna Singh. I should have said that <laughs> at the beginning. I'm a professor in political science and at the Watson Institute and uh, also on the steering committee for the Center for Contemporary South Asia and a big fan of Parasmita Singh. You can also introduce yourself. Yeah, so Parasmita, okay? You just yeah, 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 sure. Hi, I'm Faiza. I'm a senior at Brown studying South Asian studies. Hi, my name is Dhruv. I graduated last year <coughs> in math. I'm Injan, and I'm a prayer nursing instructor. <laughs> <laughs> also a fourth grader in our local public schools so on holiday for Good Friday, and a big fan of our students. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Nice to see so many familiar faces. Uh, my name's Finian Morgarity, and I teach in religious studies and I also direct the South Asian Studies concentration at the Saxena Center. So glad to be here. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Grigu, I'm Uma Jan's father, and uh, I am a big fan also of Parasmita's work. And as Prerna said, I'm an anthropologist at Ashoka. Hi, I'm Oli Ndita, Oli. Um, I'm a graduate student in the sociology department and um, also a big fan of Paris with us from um, her Pratham days and love all the books that you wrote um, with Pratham from back then, so looking forward to this. I'm Shreya. I'm a graduate student in the political science department. Um, I'm just becoming familiar with your work and I have lots of questions that I'm probably going to see you during the course of this week. 
Hi, I'm Lija. I'm a graduate student in political science. Hi, I'm Talia. I'm a junior at Brown Studies Biology. Hi, I'm William. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Public Health. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm a senior studying visual art and art history at Brown. And I'm Charlie. I'm a junior here at Brown studying uh, health and human biology with Common Global Health. Okay. Oh, great. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for um, uh, the very generous introduction. And, um, and thank you all for stepping in on a holiday. And um, I'm very, very privileged and honored to be here and to uh, share my work. Um, I'm also, I mean, and I like that we've all introduced ourselves and we are a smaller group. And uh, so I'm also really hoping that we'll be able to, so I'm going to speak, I'm going to try and speak very briefly about my work so we have a little more time for conversation because I think it's such a, um, it, it's really nice to have a, a group and I think it's nice to have questions. It's also um, because that way I, I get to hear your voices as well and what, you, uh, what you're thinking and about some of the issues that I'm going to be speaking about. Um, and, and yes, and I'm looking forward to the workshop as well. Uh, please don't feel intimidated about like, you know, uh, you're all doing scholarly work, but uh, it, it's sometimes uh, fun to have, uh, it's, it's great to have some fun with uh, materials, right? So uh, with that, I'm going to start with my uh, uh, presentations. Uh, yes, so uh, the title of my presentation, as you have noticed, is somewhat sensational, uh, right? Crisis comics. But uh, of course, we appreciate good uh, marketing strategies and, um, but I, it's also an interesting term because I think, uh, uh, because, because we are, I think we all have the sense of uh, uh, so many things happening that are uh, outside our control, whether it's ecological or uh, political. And I really do feel that uh, 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 there is a sense of, I mean, of course, there, I mean, one can always argue that, you know, especially India, of which uh, where uh, my work is located, situated, it often feels like a series of crises, right? But, uh, but yes, uh, I, I think, uh, but definitely it is a term that uh, uh, defines uh, 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 my work somewhat and uh, some of what the, that I'm going to be speaking about, right? And um, and uh, so uh, I'd also like to begin by uh, uh, briefly turning to the question of location, right? Uh, location is a very interesting ca uh, category in art production. Uh, because you know where you choose to uh, position yourself, whether you're close to the center, a little further away, uh, sometimes it determines the grounds on which exclusion is built. Uh, sometimes it's also a space of uh, resistance to not be too close to the center is also sometimes you know gives you a little more ground for uh, 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 resistance and rebellion. And, uh, and also, um, and uh, this is also a, a term that I'm going to use to somewhat place my uh, work, yes. Uh, it's always a little bit awkward for the writer or the artist to be speaking about, you know, your own work. So I'm going to try and just see it in relation to other uh, things that are happening and, uh, uh, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the events and crisis, if we may, uh, that have shaped the work as it is and have shaped uh, and, are, and continue to shape the various dilemmas and questions that, uh, uh, that, that have shaped my process and that I have to, uh, that I'm still struggling with, yes? So, um, sorry, yes, this is the page. Um, so the region I come from, and uh, the, the, the term that uh, it, it, it is, uh, I'm using, I use this term, Northeast India. Some of my books use it too. But I would so, so uh, you know, so, so really speak about the question of location. Um, it is a term that I want us to pay a little bit of attention to and to think about a little bit because, uh, because with a lot of, like a lot of other terms, it is a term with a colonial provenance, um, right? In the sense that it is, it actually, it means nothing. You know, the Northeast isn't even a geographical uh, indicator in some sense. It is, it is used for, um, for those of you who are not familiar with India, and you don't have to be, uh, it is basically, I'm talking about the region that is connected to the entire land mass that's connected by what we call the chicken neck, a very, very thin sli uh, 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 slice of land that connects uh, uh, this, the, the, the main body to this little strip of land that goes, that is just below that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that is just below China in the map, 
Can you see that? So it shares, uh, it, it shares so the northeastern, this entire region out there, it shares international borders. It shares more uh, borders, land borders with more uh, foreign countries, international borders than India. Right? So if you look at the map, you sort of get a sense of that. It shares a border with China, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. And these are things that become very important in the way uh, it is perceived, in the way knowledge about this region is produced. And, uh, and also this term, uh, Northeast, uh, uh, it, it has um, a lot of the, coloni a lot of the uh, colonial baggage that it comes through. It also passes on to the post-colonial Indian states. Uh, uh, mm, uh, perception as well as, uh, uh, and, and this continued uh, production of knowledge in a similar vein, right? So the other thing is, uh, the other thing that one must uh, um, also keep in mind is that uh, uh, it's just in the last couple of decades, it has, uh, it's not been very central to uh, the national integration project. Right, and that 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 uh, things, as we know, things are changing very fast now, and uh, that the, the politics is evolving. Uh, but but uh, but uh, to when my work was located, nineties, two thousands, it there was still a sense of uh, 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 there was still a sense of difference in that, and um, and and so this region also the other and politically, this region was also framed as an area of exception. So you had very, very draconian military uh, uh, laws that applied to this region, which did not apply to the rest of the country. Of course, I'm generalizing, and these are some questions that we can take when we uh, arrive at the question and answer session. But you know, again, the, what, we what I spoke about crisis, and that we are in some kind of a political crisis at the moment in India. But yes, you know, these, but there have been, but there is also a history of crisis. There are also these areas of exception when the rule of law and a lot of things that uh, uh, democratic rule of law and so on have been very, very tenuous, to say the least, right? And uh, yes, and also the other thing is, um, uh, it's very this this region is very multi-ethnic, very multi-religious, uh, diverse uh, with a um, very biodiverse, as well as the history of uh, resource extraction, right? So I'm just yeah. So this is it. I mean, I'm not going to go uh, more into details. Yes, it's also very interesting for me to speak about my nonfiction work because most of my, uh, uh, because primarily I've been working with fiction, right? And these are really questions we can sort of uh, come back to later about what the differences, what the implications of someone who has worked with fiction most of their life and, you know, sort of the move to nonfiction and how that, you know, affects your uh, body of work and so on. So, yes, so the so one of my uh, primary uh, books was Hotel at the End of the World, which was a graphic novel in, uh, that I uh, published in 2009. And, um, and 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 really and and in its, and in some sense uh, there wasn't um, so the the book a lot of the stories of this book is set in the northeast or from that region and the book really rose out of a, a particular time when uh, we didn't have that much in popular culture about the region so a lot of it did involve primary you know uh, the. Uh, a lot of the, I, I, I really had to sort of travel and get stories. So, so there is some, uh, you know, there is a core of this that com that comes into the nonfiction work later. But of course, what one could do with fiction was, uh, like, like say in this one, you see that little, uh, you see the tank out there. So there is a tank, in um, there is a Second World War tank that is located in the middle of Kohima town. It's just sitting there. And you know, and in Indian history textbooks and uh, in the school curriculum, you don't read about this, right? And all of this sort of comes to play now in the kind of political debates that's going on. But it is there, you know. You don't read about the involvement of the of this particular region in the Second World War and so on. So what I was able to do with this book was like unearth some of these stories and get into circulation and prepare a book and have a a, 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 a form of storytelling around it. Yeah, so. Um, Yes, and of course, then uh, the, uh, I have uh, uh, I've worked on children's uh, books. It's also a graphic novel, and um, then centerpiece. And uh, so centerpiece was another very interesting project, which looked at both fiction and nonfiction. It was an edited book, but it was a book that really gave me a chance to to um, speak to the larger community of uh, women artists and writers and poets and photographers. So if you have a chance, there's a display copy out there, so you can flip through it just to have a sense of um, um, of how, um, I, where, where you try to tell the story of uh, a region and, uh, um, 
through a variety of voices. And this is also where I began to feel very much that form is political. You know, and that, and, and so, uh, and I use, and we use the term Northeast there, but we are also constantly challenging what this term means and trying to not so much define it, but also allowing uh, the space to perhaps uh, 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 completely do away with it while we still uh, play with it. So there is a lot of, so, so, uh, so this whole question of location is central to a uh, uh, centerpiece. And uh, so I'm just going to read out these, uh, uh, a couple of lines from the introduction to Centerpiece to give you a sense of, again, to go back to the question of location and how, it, uh, uh, and how it's something that's constantly, um, something that I'm grappling with constantly in my work. Right. So uh, what if we were to attempt the telling of this story through a variety of means, through poetry and portraits and essays, Older traditions like textile art and new home-cooked genres like hashtag poetry tapped into a smartphone. Is there a chance here of reclaiming the construct of the Northeast, infusing it with the potential of writing and thought and art? Because writing and art, while we are mindful of location and categories, also has the capacity to resist uh, state and national borders, right? So. Um, so it's really a question of when you're in it, you're in this uh, uh, situation, you're in these categories, but how do you work around them and you know, build them up as spaces of resistance, right? <clears throat> so, uh, and, and with this, I'm going to really step into, uh, oh yes, there was another book, it's a book of short stories. Um, um, it, it would have been a nicer jump to go from centerpiece to my nonfiction work, but yes, I also did a book of short stories, which I can speak about later in the question and answer session. If we, um, yes, right. So again, uh, the question of form and, uh, and, how, and how that influences uh, what you're writing about and uh, so on. Uh, so this is, uh, so in 2018, I began to work on a graphic uh, nonfiction reportage series, and uh, it also goes to it, because one has to also have the uh, have an idea of the kind of media scape, and uh, and very little opportunity and resources that we work with in a country like this, and you know regions like this, right? So yes, India is a huge country. It is really, really, it's a big country, a lot of things going on, but I think the other, uh, but but one has to also keep in mind that we work with very, very, very few resources. Right, and even the resources that we work with, even those are often a question of privilege, right? And uh, so, so the fact is that I could not even get, a, even though I worked very strongly with this medium, I never, I couldn't get a nonfiction a commission until 2018. So it's also a question of like you work with what you get a little bit for uh, the, for those of you who hope to be practitioners and so on, right? Um, so I was commissioned by Huffington Post India, which is uh, which does not exist anymore. Right again, the question of location. So when we so so uh, this is available online, but not in the Huffington Post India website because that's been taken down, right? And that can be another thing that we discuss or not. But so where do where, where they do exist is in the Huffington Post U.S. or something archives, right? Which is also a sort of strange. Uh, I mean, that's a strange categorization that I've sort of enjoyed playing with sometimes. You know, when some when. When in digital space something goes from being from being its own entity into an archive, so it still exists, but you know, in terms of uh, uh, algorithms and everything, it's sort of pushed back. It's in the archives now, right? And uh, that is another story in itself. So yes, but but they were still there in 2018, and they had a, a, a very good team, and they commissioned this series of nonfiction graphic reportage on. Um, on the political situation, on, on many, on the political situation in Assam. So I did a series of stories based in uh, various things that were happening in Assam at uh, uh, that point. So yes. So one of the things that I looked at was a particular, was a citizenship test. Right, so for, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't have to follow India, so I'm just, but, but like those, some of you may know a little more about it, but I'm just going to very, very briefly give you the gist of the citizenship test. So this was a result, again, you know, because we share borders with a lot of countries out there, right? So this was a, uh, so this was a result of um, many, many political processes and uh, incidents going right back to partition of the country and beyond. Yes, and uh, so the, but the basic tenet of this, uh, 
citizenship test was that every citizen or every person who lived in the land of Assam and claimed to be a citizen or, or, or laid claims to citizenship would have to have documentation. So it is not enough to just have your regular citizenship documents. You would have, have, you would have to have documents that um, proved lineage that proved that your descendants were there through document state documentation to before 1971. So it was this huge bureaucratic exper uh, 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 experiment. It was just like every single bureaucratic office in the state were taken over. School teachers were sort of uh, uh, sent off. Um, you know, people from various government uh, departments uh, were sent off to these newly established uh, 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 departments where their job was to basically figure out, you had, you had these, was to draw family trees. And this was done under the Supreme Court of India. It was a very, very complicated process. I just can't get into more details now because we just, otherwise we'll never be able to come out of that spiral. But, so this is what I went into document. And, and my, the particular focus that my work was, was on women and how women, because of uh, the particular society, uh, patriarchal societies, often do not have access to any kind of state documentation, right? They don't own land, they don't own property. Often they're, uh, they, uh, often, you know, very, very uh, underprivileged societies, you know, they will not, uh, they, won't go, they won't have school leaving certificates. And for how women, for women in these uh, 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 situations, it was very, very difficult to locate, to get this documentation. The other thing that is also important to state right out here was that this test, targeted one particular community, which had, uh, it affected everyone, right? But it targeted one particular community, which has had long-standing histories of migration and connection with the state of Bangladesh. Okay. I mean, it's just there, just, it sort of shares a border with Sam, right? Um, one of the many countries that border uh, Northeast India, Bangladesh, yes. Yes, so I was looking particularly at women and how this whole process affected women. Uh, so, right. So for those of you who are, who are practitioners, who are interested in the graphic novel as a form, I must, of course, step back for a moment away from, uh, and also uh, uh, just speak about how well it worked at the level of form. It did, really. You know, I work, I mean, I, I particularly, I very deliberately went for a very sketchbookish effect with pencils and, you know, not this very hyper-realist or, you know, like a comic book mode. It was also a practical choice because unlike other assignments that you had to, you, you, I, I was working very strongly with a news cycle. Right, which has its own very, very different challenges to working on a, a piece of fiction or working for a publication, other publication, because the news, uh, because the news, uh, 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 the, I mean, the, the, the whole, uh, the, the news ecology works very strongly with deadlines and you know what is in news and out of it and all of that, right? So yes, so, um, so uh, yes, graphic reportage is, uh, it's a great way to tell a story. If you can get a good, ed see, if you can get some, a good editor someone in a good place to support you because that is necessary, you know. This interface, you will really need someone who will be able to understand the medium and help you edit and all of that. So at the level of form, it was a very, very exciting thing to do because I had to deal with editors who were mostly working with pros but were able to sort of accommodate what I was trying to do. A lot of given through a very, very rich experience for a graphic novelist, right? And um, so, so yes, and, and also, you know, just to be able to use visual cues to be able to explain very complicated processes, uh, which were bewildering even for the people, mostly for the people undergoing it, yes, but, you know, even for readers. So, it's, so yes, the graphic novel medium as a form, it just, I was really uh, able to, uh, uh, I really felt like there was a lot that I could do with it uh, for this project. Yes. Mm. And then, oh, so yeah, yes, then, um, but but what uh, but what were really really interesting from the level of my, uh, from the perspective of my work were the many ethical questions that this project brought up as a practitioner or as a writer, right? Um, first of all, I realized because I started to follow the work that other journalists were doing, and you know, so because we were, you were, you were I was literally working in tandem with that, them. We were breaking stories at the same time, and uh, one of the reason one of the things that I found was. Uh, how difficult this whole uh, traditional mm -hmm. mode of story, uh, you know, this, the, the traditional journalistic modes were, and uh, especially for a situation like that. Because um, one was that I found that there was very little work being done by informed, where you were able to get the informed consent of the people who were uh, speaking to you. 
So people really wanted to speak to you. They wanted to have their stories told because they were in a very precarious situation because nothing is as precarious in the modern world as the risk of losing your citizenship. And not just losing your citizenship, there was no knowing what would happen. So this is not like being deported because most people didn't have a home, a home country to be deported to, right? They claimed to be uh, uh, Indians or whatever. They had that claim. It was just that they did not have the documents to prove it. Right, so it was very precarious situation, and there were also, uh, and also, between the people who were doing the reporting, us, and between the people who were uh, being reported or who were telling us the story, there was also the, uh, it were, there was also the issue of class, many many levels of privilege, right, which is really something that is very central to this kind of projects in the uh, in uh, the, the the region that I'm speaking about. Um, and so there was, uh, the, you know, the, the privileges of caste, religion, class, language, education, all of that, including language. So the language in which I spoke and did the interviews is not the language in which I wrote. Okay, so here I should also step back and say the digital, but the other great thing was that this was a digital uh, publication. Right, so but there was a uh, but there were, but that was nice because with the digital publication. Once I had the first story, I was really able to show people the work I was doing. Unlike say a publication or a book where you have to tell them something is going to come in the future, and this there was that there was that immediacy that I was able to just you know and everyone was able to sort of do a search and so there was that accessibility that you know uh, that I was able to share with the people I was speaking to. But then again, you know that was just one part of the story. There were all these other layers, and it was just not me, it was all the other journalists as well. And, um, and, 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 or I, and, and in some ways, I really felt that, again, to go back to the question of location, to go back to the idea of the Northeast being a colonial uh, 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 trope, uh, a colonial term. Because you know the photographs, because the other thing that they wanted were photographs. Because for a news piece to carry the conviction to for the you know the the to to the, 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 the there were these demands for photographs in a lot of the other publications, okay, and it felt very much like we were just repeating the old thing of these you know people placed against these with or you know with or without consent being placed against their homesteads or whatever and being like photographed. And then to have no control whatsoever with the circulation of these images, and uh, so these were so th so these were really issues that I started to grapple with. And in some sense, um, of course, um, I felt that sketching, you know, it became a more um, it was it became in in some sense, or maybe this was just my own self explication, but it felt a more humane way to go about this. It was more interactive. It was it I felt like it really did create a space where I was able to. Uh, have some kind of exchange, uh, some more, I mean, where, where the, the space was not perhaps as harsh and as, uh, 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 and as terrible as, uh, as you know, normal sort of, you know, this very documentary mode of photographing and, uh, and so of, of the news cycle. Yes, um, and there's a lot of curiosity and, you know, I think some amount of engagement I was able to uh, think. Yes, and the other question, yes. Yeah, but there were still a lot of questions. For instance, the whole thing of like, this was a story that people really wanted. The people who were suffering wanted the story to be told, wanted it to go outside, because there, there is a lot of hope for nonfiction to bring about justice. There is a hope. When people tell you the story, often they do it with the hope that something, someone in power somewhere will hear this. And this is, and I would be constantly reiterating that, you know, Look, this is just going to be a piece somewhere, but it was there, and it was something that you know I, you have to accept as a part of the whole uh, 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 promise of you being there and trying to listen to someone's story. Yeah. So, uh, so, the, but, but there were a lot of, and this was a larger debate. It was just not me among all the debates. What do you do? So, if, say, for instance, a scene in a hospital, you know, with 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 these women being distraught. You know, there'd be these accidents because people were rushing off to get these documents, and people didn't care if like their loved one was like really severely injured. They would be worried about the documents. Like, oh, you know, they had that packet of documents because, and it was these uh, situations that you really uh, uh, were very, very. Uh, uh, were very important to document. But at the same time, you had questions of uh, uh, um, uh, women of certain communities who'd, who would ne who'd otherwise not be photographed, you know, who would really resist a photograph. So do you do that? Do you sketch them? And is a sketch, you know, a, OK, a sketch is perhaps not a photograph. But even then, like, this was, it was very, very murky, very tenuous grounds of this. And these were things that, as you were producing, the questions were happening. And often, you didn't have really a, a, an answer in that sense. And then finally, yes, and then, okay, I'll come back to this later. Yes, and finally, uh, 
but uh, but then as always, I just feel like uh, so many, I think so many of us do community work. So many of us keep going back to these places to do these stories because I think a lot of the answers come from there. They may not be the perfect answers. And for me, uh, the, and for me, uh, uh, what was really, really, really significant was this act of refusal, right? So you can't follow. Uh, it's, uh, so what happened? I'm just going to read out these two lines that are there in one of the stories. So this is, again, I'm speaking to someone who, is, who has a government case against her. Like the government has sent her a notice saying that you are not a citizen of this country. But if you still persist on wanting to be a citizen of this country, you must show, go to the court and fight a case to say you're a citizen. Right? So this is the situation she's in. And if you're not able to prove that you're a citizen, you basically go to jail. I mean, you know, you're sort of taken away and imprisoned. I mean, this is roughly the in, in background in which I'm interviewing Oklima. She consented to her name being used. So the family agrees to be photographed, but not Oklima. No, not even a sketch, though they are amused to see me take out my sketchbook. So this is where, I mean, this is that, this is that fundamental thing of do not draw me. Right? And this refusal is, I think, the biggest lesson I took back from my engagement with nonfiction and my engagement with this whole uh, 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 nonfiction process. That, uh, that uh, one, it was such a powerful ge gesture because one, it was a comment on the limits of art, our continued negotiation as artists and writers of what it means to tell somebody else's story, a murkier grounds in fiction, but and also, my, and also, I think I had to still tell her story. So she allowed me to tell her story, but she put down her conditions. And I think there I really felt that we were able to arrive somewhere, you know? And, and that um, by respecting and accepting her conditions, I felt like more than anything, she helped me evolve my craft, see the dangers of the story. You know, every story does not need to be told. Or, you know, the... the, the, the uh, Yes, and uh, and and uh, the risk of uh, 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 the risk of storytelling as well, because we are always celebrating storytellings now. You know, storytelling and the story now. But what are the risks, right? Every story does not need to be told, and um, and 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 also it's really uh, it also forced me to negotiate and to constantly evolve my craft, and um, and I also found in Aklima's refusal a reflection of my many refusal in my work of fiction, nonfiction, and even the graphic novel. I was able to then, I mean, she showed me how to look at my work anew in that sense, you know, my work with fiction and nonfiction. And I began to say that, yes, this refusal has been a central part of my work too, and should be. I think this is a right that we have as writers, as well as someone telling someone else's story, and as well as someone uh, with the generosity of sharing their story, right? And um, yes, and that we do not have to follow the conventional forms of production or drawing or telling just because they're the dominant frames around us. It's, I mean, and I'm not saying, and of course, when I make these claims, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, it's very, um, when, when we do an artist presentation or a work uh, presentation, there is a clear narrative we seek to draw. And of course, you are clear that there is no such thing. It is really all these mistakes. It is all these mistakes and errors and stepping back and forth. And, um, um, and yes, so I'm going to um, end by uh, this quote that I like very much, which I completely use out of context of Adorno's, who says that uh, in the end, one cannot make one's home even in one's writing. And I view it as a, a challenge, as a constant process of building and dismantling and moving again and again as one does to renew an aesthetic and ethical uh, commitment to one's practice. Right. OK, thank you. Can I go back? Good afternoon, everyone, and really nice to be here. And thank you, Prerna, for inviting me to begin the discussion. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, 
before going to Q&A, just reintroduce one aspect of Parismita's work, um, which is this particular book, and just say a little bit about it, and then segue from that into Q&A, because uh, Prerna and I have respectively known Parismita for many years, and one of the nice things to see is an extremely creative uh, practitioner who, uh, in some ways, is the opposite of savvy, as we were just laughing uh, a little while ago. She's kind of someone who undersells almost does so much uh, that in some ways you feel they eclipse uh, some of very significant work that they're doing. So this particular book, just to put it in context, it could be like suppose our talk here was by Jumpa Lahiri, mm -hmm. who told you I do X, Y, I've done this, I've done this, and oh, I also wrote a book called Interpreter of Maladies, a book of short stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so this book, I would say that even if Parismata had done uh, um, just this book, is, I, I would say, a major achievement of contemporary fiction. So in my remarks, because Parismita said I also wrote a book of stories, I'm just going to just briefly introduce you to this yes. particular book. My own engagement most recently with Parismita has been in uh, the context of students in India, where I was teaching a class at Ashoka University, uh, unfortunately titled Indian Civilization. Uh, the title was not mine. It's a compulsory class that has to be taught to all undergraduate majors. It's one of the, it's called a foundation class, but I took it as a challenge that I'm an anthropologist and I should be able to say something about such a thing. Uh, so I taught it in the way that I would like. And in one of the weeks, uh, my class, which was 100 students, we all read uh, four stories from this uh, book, from Peace Has Come, uh, which are stunning. So even if... Parismita was not a graphic novelist. This is a book of short stories in text. Uh, we read four stories in particular, but just to give you a flavor of them, one story with which, which we read from this book is called An Incident in Late Autumn. Uh, and it begins with, uh, I forget the chronology of it is not important, but it's a girl and a boy who meet in a forest and they're chatting and they were classmates. And then suddenly you see somebody else watching a news clip of a girl who's been beheaded uh, by uh, in by a rebel separatist group. Uh, and then, like in a tradition of fiction that many of us would recognize from, say, Rashomon or from uh, multi-perspective fiction, we see from different perspectives we come closer to this incident uh, from the TV reporter's perspective, from the journalist's perspective, and then we realize the trajectory by which this beheading happens, and we've begun with the girl and the boy chatting, uh, and then they suspect that the girl is an informant, and so then the separatist group finds her and the guy has been caught by the police and so you see various things happening leading up to that particular incident beginning with the simplest interaction of the classmate in a forest who you bump into uh, two young people uh, I'll also read you just the last lines of this book Peace Has Come uh, because my class discussed uh, we discussed with Parismita many things but one of the things we discussed was that for social science what are the kinds of conceptual questions that fiction might raise uh, so one concept we discussed uh, was the idea of ceasefire. What does it mean, ceasefire? Uh, and how does one understand that as a lived experience? Uh, and this is the last story from the triptych called Peace Has Come, uh, in which there are two young men on a motorcycle and they have kind of a scary interaction at a check post. Uh, and then, thankfully, uh, they're okay and then they continue driving. Uh, but this is how it ends. Uh, <clears throat> but as they veered away from the highway towards the town, Dusk fell, swiftly turning the colors of the land. The dust road ahead became a pale white river against the dark of the rice fields and the sky ahead, a deep, deep red of sleep. Suddenly, a great sadness weighed down upon them, and they felt the loneliness of tall trees and silent hearths. Peace had come to this land, and they were the only ones to know. End quote. Uh, and that last line is like, Sometimes for a writer, it's like you work many years to earn a particular line. Uh, I would say that this line is like uh, poetry, like visual, painting, anything. Peace had come to this land, and they were the only ones to know. Uh, so I would say <coughs> that in discussing Parismita's work, she's, not, she's definitely a graphic artist and a no graphic novelist, but also just also a novelist. Uh, so let me begin the discussion with that, that maybe there's some terms that you use that, uh, of course, all of us take for granted, uh, graphic novels, fiction, non-fiction. Uh, but suppose we were to say that actually peace has come, for example, even though it's a purely text-based mm -hmm. novel, it is clearly by someone who knows visual mm -hmm. uh, work very deeply. Uh, so just if we were to think about 
piece has come and your work in Huffington Post stories, mm -hmm. for example. So what is it you feel that the medium of something like this allows you to do mm -hmm. uh, that the Huffington Post stories differently mm -hmm. allow you to do? So Huffington Post stories, of course, we can see, you know, it'll reach a wide audience immediately. Uh, it is great. It's the Huffington Post, unfortunately now banned in India. Uh, but what are you able to do in this that you feel you aren't able to do in the Huffington mm -hmm. Post story? If you were just to say traditional text yes, literature yes, like yes, we yes, grew up yes, with. Yeah. Sometimes you can respond to this and then you can open it up. Yeah. Thank you so much for those clarifications. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. So. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, uh, yes. Um, this is, I mean, considering I spent so much time <laughs> telling every yes, that, um, so I think fundamentally, there are they are different, right? They're diff they're just different modes of um, they're different modes of um, arriving at stories, like the as well as I think um, as well as the way you'd approach them. Even for a reader and a writer, they're just one is that uh, the the Huffington Post series is very much um, uh, they're, they're very much immediate reactions and like you know you're just on the it's it's very journalistic for, for you know and journalists will probably not like me using the term this way but uh, yes I mean there's they're sort of your uh, you don't have that much time you don't have I mean it's a it's a function of time you know which is which is such a and, and you know and especially now you know we are, we are all struggling with deadlines and they're good things sometimes and like time right so in the uh, so so for instance piece has come took me seven years. Right, like each of the stories, and I wrote the stories, and I wrote the stories really quickly. Just the writing of the stories uh, was a very, very—I mean, it didn't take me that long. But, but, but the, for the book to happen, you know, it, just, it was a really—it's a long duration, like, for, like for me, right? Like it was even longer than pieces uh, than, than than Hotel at the End of the World, even though that required, even though graphic novels require a lot of labor like you really have to draw 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 and you know this like very so so yes one is the function of time like that that if you uh, and that is the biggest gift that is such a it's it's a very very difficult thing so what i was able to do with pieces come right i mean i i mean in a sense that i can't compare it to uh, what i was what uh, i was just able to put together in some sense with huffington with the huffington post pieces but then again, and you know, this is really also a comment on the way we consume uh, 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 literature or knowledge. But, uh, but yes, the Huffington Post pieces had just had greater reach. You know, it's just so much more difficult to push a book of uh, short stories, which are again located in a region that is not even very familiar to many Indians, as you'll know. So this was a book, so, so uh, yes. Uh, and the other thing is that the news cycle, you know, the Huffington Post pieces had a larger thing because it was, because the SAM was, because the NRC and the SAM and the citizenship, the citizenship tests were then trending, mm -hmm. right? So yes, so both of these function with very, very different dynamics of like, uh, uh, outside dynamics. And, and yes, for me all, I mean, you know, I, I think what you're able to do with prose, what you're able to do with a, a, a piece of, fiction or non-fiction or something that you're able to take time over, that, that sometimes that almost, I would, I, I would almost say that where you can allow for the stories to come to you. Yes, that is the big difference. For me, you know, I never intended to write pieces come. Because in terms of, in terms of career arc, though, it's completely like it was a very, very, it was not a necessary thing to do. Because for a graphic novelist to then write a book of short stories, you know, none of this makes sense in the, for, in the commercial. And we also have to exist in that zone. It just didn't make any sense. So in some sense, that uh, uh, with, with, peace of, with peace has come, the stories came and found me. I really feel like that. And it's such a, it's such a strange thing to say because I can't explain it. Mm -hmm. But yes, in, but in many ways, the stories came to me. While in Huffington Post, while, while with these kind of pieces, I very much went there and found the stories. You know, I was really there and like, you know, where's the story that moment? So yes, but thank you so much for your question because I, I you know, mm. I've not had an occasion to sort of think of both of these in this Together. sense. Very thank nice. you. Thank you. So I'll just ask one more question then open it up for discussion. Uh, but also in the hope that you'll continue to do this kind of work because hopefully it has a horizontal reach. These stories are eternal in some ways. Uh, one of my students said that I asked, they had to write a comment thought on the stories. What did you, uh, what's the connecting thread between the stories? Uh, and the one student wrote that it, these stories teach you it's a mistake to fall in love. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, so yes, I think oh, that, so uh, <laughs> that uh, 
the literature hopefully will have a longer life in a different way so one other question on this that um, since you've been also involved as Prerna mentioned in her introduction in the graphic novel for so long particularly in India um, tried different forms of um, uh, Paris Smith had also um, begun a collective called Pao Collective mm -hmm. uh, Pao meaning bread uh, which was a way f for Graphic novelists, mm -hmm. Sarnath Banerjee, Orjit Sen, Parismita, and one other person two, two, two. Uh, had begun this POW collective. So for decades, Parismita has been involved in sort of the um, initiation and fate of mm -hmm. the graphic novel in India. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you find now, 20 years later, do you find it disappointing uh, or uh, yeah. exciting? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the, given that as distinct from the comic, mm -hmm. which is has a different history in India mm -hmm. and mm, a very different life in relation to mythology, etc. Specifically, the graphic novel. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about it in contemporary um, mm -hmm. contemporary literature in mm -hmm. India? Uh, especially with this 20 year, literally now we are really talking in terms of 20 years. Yes, yes. No, for, first of all, I, I see I've never, I, I don't make a distinction between graphic novels and comics, but I do sense what but the distinction you make in, in terms of mass produced uh, comics as well as like more uh, in the, perhaps. Yes, so um, I think the graphic novel in India is not doing very well when it comes to the publishing house, when it comes to the mainstream publishing houses. Because as you know, global publishing houses have a, 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 a life of their own, which is completely, you know, which is caught up in a lot of these other uh, uh, power dynamics, which have nothing, uh, uh, and you know, a lot of like global stuff, basically. I mean, this book is uh, 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 out of print now because the publishing house, because it was, uh, uh, because the publishing house just shut down, right? So I mean, these things happen when it comes to, but but I have also, but but hotel, this book, most of the most of my books have all also been, I've also had books with mainstream publishing houses, right? And that's a different story altogether because uh, who knows what they want to like, you know, I mean, you know, who knows what they want to commission, what they want to uh, sell and what sells. Uh, it's, it's a very, very uh, gray and murky area. But then again, but, I, but, uh, but um, digital media, social media, graphic novels are actually doing very, very well in that. Right, so in fact, uh, I'm not doing that much work, but uh, that's uh, but 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 generally, uh, a lot of graphic novelists have actually turned very very political in the last ten years. Even people who otherwise were very sort of you know were more uh, were, were engaging with history and were engaging with fantasy and all of that have turned very political in the last. I mean, there's a whole lot of them who have. Right, so uh, uh, and 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 they may not be getting they may not be getting very big publishing deals. Right, and so you may not, uh, they may not, uh, 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 perhaps they may not have the kind of renown you would expect if everything were to be going well, but they're doing a lot of good work. I see that with uh, younger people, with, with aspiring graphic novelists, independent graphic novelists, I think social media is working very well for that, where you're able to sort of, you know, serialize things and you're able to use it as commentary on political uh, events. And, and that is also the way form is, right? Like it, it evolves politically. It evolves with with uh, uh, with the times, you know. It evolves so so. Digital media has been a great boon for uh, graphic novels. I haven't been particularly, I mean, for a variety of reasons, been able to use it. Uh, 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 but uh, but yes. Uh, so I, I I don't. So things have the situ things have changed, mm -hmm. and uh, and there is and censorship is an issue in India today, right? And as a graphic novelist, uh, I mean, you know, it is it is really an important. It's an impo it's an important factor in the way art is going to be produced now in the future there or contemporary art, right? And so, um, and, and yes, so social media, digital, which are also easy to police. So it, it's, it's really, it's becoming, but, but it is an interesting scene. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's a nice uh, note to segue to mm. audience questions. And uh, just, I mean, I, from that, all I can feel is some sense of dismay at how things trend or not, because Karan, I was just saying that if anything ought to be trending in recent Indian fiction, it is this book. Mm. Um, and so I certainly hope uh, that it won't be out of print five years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, so let us turn to the audience and open yeah. it up for questions. And how do you want to divide up, Prerna, the uh, evening? Yeah,
Um, yeah, sure. And then yeah. maybe if you could kind of guide us through the workshop component of yeah. this. Yeah, but I'd be happy. But you know, I think the sense I'm getting is also that if people have questions, I'm happy to have a conversation. So we should, I mean, I wouldn't stress that much about the time, you know, we just, if there are questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what, what, what? So would you like to transition to the workshop in... <laughs> no, this is such a wonderful yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. Karan? Hi, I'm Karan Mahajan. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I teach at Brown and I also write fiction. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love I'm the sorry, just I Are you wearing a bandhala? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to fit in. Oh. <laughs> so, but I, I'm sad that mm -hmm. context, yeah, your publishing house, I mean, that yeah. was a... Amazon like mm. fiasco, right? They mm -hmm. Yeah, right. But it's coming. But but now, like, but but again, uh, like a lot of good things, they've been able to regroup very interestingly. The publishing house. So should I? Yeah. So so yes. So um, as one of the poets was also published by. Uh, so it was an imprint of Amazon, right? But they had a very very. So we were all very hesitant about signing up to begin with, but they had a very very good editorial team. And for a book like that, you know, because of the, the kind of dynamics with which I write, I really needed people who are willing to accept, like, without an appendix with, like, all the meanings of, or an explanation of who is which group and all of that. So I had a very good, so, um, but, you know, this poet commented later when everything went bust and the public, that, yes, we went with Amazon, there were bound to be repercussions. So, yes, so one was that, uh, uh, it was a, a imprint of Amazon and it went bust and they sort of just think but the really great thing was that this great editorial team the, I mean not, not just the editorial team, the entire team they were able to sort of because they were such a great team they were able to negotiate with uh, another publishing house to just take the entire imprint and move so they didn't get sold by Amazon like another company didn't buy they just moved to another setup like the entire technicalities of it I don't know mm. but, I, but it was such an impressive thing like they negotiated not just for one or two editors, but for everyone, the entire marketing team, everyone just moved. So it's still called Westland, and hopefully they will do a paperback of this at some point. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, good question. Yes. Me hmm? I mean, we can keep track of. Uh, we can. I was about to call on Oni, but mm -hmm. I guess you <laughs> raised your hand anyway. Since you, you have such a versatile repertoire, really, I wanted to, I'm just curious to know where that fits in for you. Is it, you know, it, you've talked a little bit about how the, the, the graphic part mm -hmm. of your work and the textual part of your work speak to each other and have shaped each other, and even in terms of time and mm -hmm. the, the, the substance of what you were, you were writing about. But yeah, so what, what, what does that serve, what place does that hold for you in terms yeah. of a pause or a reckoning? Yes, or I'm yes, really yes, curious yes. to mm. see how that's shaped your storytelling for younger mm. audiences. Yeah, children's books. Yes, yeah, so I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to answer your question directly because it's too much fun uh, to not. <laughs> so basically, I'm doing a very interesting children's book project at the moment, and I think it speaks a little bit of. I, I think it'll speak to uh, the time when we were together at the, uh, uh, the nonprofit. So, um, you know, go t going from all this work that I've been doing, which is basically mostly telling other people's stories. My fiction is also just telling other people's stories, and often, and often people who are not able to read my work because it's in English. 
So for instance, Peace Has Come works with many, many languages in this thing, but none of them are English. And the book is written in English. So, you know, at some point, you know, all of this really, I think it's just, just uh, these are this uh, a very, very sort of interesting thing in the background. So one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm doing these workshops on, um, with communities on children's books. So what I'm doing is I'm going to these uh, space, uh, I, you know, so I'm work, uh, going to rural areas or uh, uh, places where there isn't, where there aren't too many children's books. Because children's books projects to be supported, uh, to be successful are often state supported, you know, especially for countries like ours, like Russian books and so on. Or you need like a nonprofit, Patham books, like to be, to be able to have books in countries like India which are accessible and well priced, you know, where it's not going to be, where it's not going to cost you your month's ration, right? I mean, chil real children's books for everyone. So, uh, so I'm working with this nonprofit to work with the community. So I'm trying to get, so the other thing that's happening is also a lot of the time the children's books you get, very wonderful ones in India are off, but, but you know, there are all these questions of class and caste and who gets to tell these stories, who gets to go to design school, who gets to write these stories, all of that. So, uh, so what I'm doing now is I'm going to these communities and I'm working with people who already work with the arts, like say they're carpenters or weavers and so on, and I'm trying to workshop children's stories with them. And that's been a really, really fun as well as rewarding experience. Like, I think both even for my practice, and I see this very much, and I'm going there very much as a part, and I'm seeing this very much as a part of my practice. And that's really been, so yes, I've continued to work with children's books, but perhaps in a slightly different, like just with this, yeah. So thank you for that question. Yes. Um, I have a question about your like nonfiction work that mm -hmm. you, you were showing with that thing post, and you, you had one comment of like not every story needs to be told, mm. which I thought was really powerful. Mm. And so, as an artist, and you know, both in kind of writing, but then also in drawing as well, um, and then as the kind of putting on like a journalistic hat as well, like. How do you choose which stories are told specifically in the moment, right? With news, mm -hmm. those stories could have you know big impacts, and that might be an important story. So how do you make that decision um, in terms of that calculation? Yes. So you know uh, what I found very useful in dealing, and I and I you know I don't even think I get it right most of the time, right? I may probably I may think that I'm doing a story for all the right reasons, and who knows, right? Like with all the afterlifes of stories. And, and obviously with my whole, my, you know, with a lifetime of dealing with the stories, I do not underestimate the power of stories both ways. It's risks as well as, because you can, and I, you know, it is really something one should be openly speaking about, because you can really go to jail today for telling a story. It is, it is the way it is now. Right, so, and, and also to have a story told about you. So you, there's also this element of risk. So what I try to foreground now is what, um, it's basically feminist ethics of care. I try to foreground that, which is that a story I may feel, because I also have the writer's instinct for a good story, right? I want, like I see a story, I want to tell it. And I also acknowledge that fiction is very murky. For, for, in the sense that, I, because I'm telling other people's stories, I don't, so what I do is I do a lot of disguising, so you make sure that, you know, that no one can be identified or whatever, but at the end of the day, I am taking someone's story, and I live with that, you know, and I suppose maybe I try to compensate by other work, but it is very much a core of the way it works, and I don't really, I think the ethics of that, I don't know, I haven't, I mean, you know, um, it's hard to work that out. But with nonfiction, what I try to foreground is that yes, I may want to tell the story very desperately. I, I mean, I may feel very strongly about the story. I may even want, and I use the word desperate, you know, it is really like that. You know, when there is a story and you need to tell it, there's a connection and immediacy. But I've learned to also step back that I have to foreground ethics of care that it has to really be about how is the story going to affect this person. We, and there have been stories, like I did, I did like, oh my God, I did six months of work on like foreigners' tribunals. And in the end, I didn't go through it. On foreigners' tribunals. Sorry, so basically in Assam, you have this institution called foreigners' tribunals. I mean, it's a very, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's also history behind all of this, which, unfortunately affect the most marginalized people, but there are, I mean, but you know, different communities have different opinions on it. It's a very, very complicated situation. But there is something called foreigners' tribunals, where basically what happens is that, you know, we have something called a border police force. And uh, they, they are able to, and they can 
uh, send you a note. They can sort of send you, they can file a case against you saying that so-and-so is a foreigner. And you'll get this documentation. And then you have to take this. And then there'll be these courts where you have to go and fight your case to say that, no, I am not a foreigner. And he's, these are my documents. And, and then you have to hire a lawyer. It's like a proper, it's like, it's like a, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not directly, it's, it's, it's a quasi, like it's a, it's a sort of strange space, but they're courts. Right, so that's what, uh, uh, so, so I did six months of work on foreigners' tribunals, and I didn't do a single story out of that. Because, I mean, you know, I was really not sure of like, you know, how that was, uh, uh, of whether I was going to be able to protect all the people I was writing about, even functionaries, right, who I, uh, uh, or even the, or even the way I was able to access a lot of this. Because I also, because many of us also use certain forms of privilege to be able to access some of these, right? And, and it didn't, and that was a story I didn't work on. So there are also, actually all my life I've been conscious of that some of the best stories are those I will never write, right? And, 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 and this is also a reaction to, this, uh, to, the, to the kind of political environment we live in, I think. So thank you for that question, right? I think there's some undergraduate yeah. questions as well. There's one, I think there's uh, one. Yeah. 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 Um, I had one, maybe you answered it, but it was kind of like a flip question of, where he asks about like, but I'm interested in like fiction and mythology. Like how much of that, like I know you draw from like real mm. incidences and like people that you know and like stories around you, but what is the guide act when you're like creating? Like do you want to always, um, like does it always have to be like a learning curve for like the readers that are reading your book or like is it something that just out of your pure creativity, like what's the balance between the two? Do you create stuff only mm -hmm. for like your own pleasure, or like there always has to be a bigger idea? Yes, 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 um, yes, yeah. Can I add yeah. on to both a question yeah, yeah. that's actually related to both William and Viraj's mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the question is, w which stories do you choose to tell and mm -hmm. not to tell, and then, you know, mm -hmm. to what extent mm -hmm. is it it's like you share yeah. someone else's story versus yours? And I guess because you're such a shapeshifter and mm -hmm. such a kind of competent and amazing and mm -hmm. unorthodox shapeshifter. I've always wondered, like, you know, of course, in certain cases, mm. it's graphic mm. reportage, that's what it is, it's definition, mm. it's commission. But in other cases, you know, how do you, how do you, do you kind of have an ex ante sense of what form it's going to take? Mm. Or is it that it kind of shifts? I mean, have you had an experience in which something began as a kind of graphic mm. and then took over text? Or mm. I'm just kind of curious, you know, just how your mind kind of mm -hmm. processes yeah. this question of not just what questions you're asking, mm. how much, how you're engaging with them, but also that form. And, and whether that, you know, whether what we see is the original form in which mm. you thought, or, yeah, mm. I mean, I don't know, I have grad students in the room, but I can only think like visually in terms of boxes and things. So mm. when there's narrative, it has to follow from that. So I'm just kind of curious, mm -hmm. um, you know, how that works for you. Yeah. Yes, so the prose, yeah, so I'll just, sort of go through this to yes. So the prose took me by surprise. Like I was, I mean, you know, I had not written prose in years and years. I began, I think I began writing prose as one does, but I had just not written prose for years and years and years. And then, and of course behind the prose, there was one failed graphic novel, one failed children's graphic novel, where I did 100 pages of like black and white work. And then somehow, somehow it just like, and, and, but so yeah, so so much of it is yes. This whole question of you know, so much of it is is I think we are all so much of it is the politics around us, that you know of the publishing. So for instance, I was I worked and so much of, and some of it maybe is our own like I don't know, our own conscious or unconscious reactions to that and our and our. Um, some of it is maybe just coping mechanisms. You know, maybe you change, maybe you change form to also just cope. Because what happened with this graphic novel is that it was really fun. I had this really good deal with, uh, with a Tamil newspaper. And now, you know, for us, like to be able to get a serialization in newspaper in, in a local language, it's a huge thing for graphic novelists, right? Because we are so used to 4,000 copies, 3,000 copies, that kind of number. And look at India, look at the numbers. So to actually have access to a language, to a newspaper, oh, that is like, it's really something that's, so I, you know, so I had this deal with the Tamil newspaper. And, and, and they wanted like 10 pages of comics. And it was a children's newspaper. And it was working so well. 
until the proprietor, I think, got his, until the guy who owned the newspaper, I think, got hold of a copy. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just like, I mean, I, I, think, I think it lasted about maybe four or five, I think it lasted about maybe like 50, 50 pages, 40 pages. And then it was just, uh, and then they just axed it, right? Yes, I mean, it, it, these things happen. They axed it and, they, and, then, and the only thing they told me was it was too political. <laughs> so you can, yes, so you can imagine my career in children's books was not uh, particularly successful. So I think that was so hard. And of course, the thing to do is to then get back to the, I mean, so what you should do when something like this happens, I now know, is that the next day you should get back to your desk at exactly, because you know, doing those kind of serializing, you have to sit at your desk some 12 hours, was to get back to the desk the next day and sit and do the next page anyway. But I didn't do it. I just couldn't. That book, the, you know, I just couldn't, like that book never happened. After that, I wrote the prose. So now I've never thought of it. I've never thought of, I've just, I've just been like, oh, this was, I've never thought of why I do it. But sometimes I think maybe, you know, I needed to step back. Maybe I didn't have the energy to do another graphic novel. Who knows? Yes. But to again go back to the question of what is one, of course, I draw for pleasure. I mean, pleasure is why we work, isn't it? It has to be, there has to be at the core of our, at the heart of our work, there has to be pleasure. Otherwise, I mean, you know, otherwise what is, I mean, otherwise there's no meaning to it, right? So I draw for pleasure, I write for pleasure, and that is the biggest privilege of my work, right? And see the, yes, but, but it's a, it's, but that is, it's like, it's basically like, you know, if you're cooking a meal or so, oh, I hate it when people give this analogy of cooking a meal, but I'm going <laughs> to Yes, but you know, it, it's so many things, right? So, so it is with writing or drawing or telling a story, right? There is the pleasure, there is the pain, there is the ethics, and there is the money, and there is the commerce, and you know, there is just all of it. And it is going to have to be a dance between all of this, you know? It isn't, I mean, I think. And of course, there are things that you can, and, but, but there are also choices, and all of these are choices you make. You can also choose to say, for instance, I've been working on this one series of just drawings, and that, I have said, is that is just for my pleasure. But you know, even there, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a very inspiring story, I must yeah. say. But uh, just to, uh, I mean, go back to that, uh, the friend of mine who recommended your um, pieces come has said how visually striking the mm. stories are, even though they're in text. Uh, so, uh, and he actually that works on Netflix series and stuff, mm. and had said how strongly uh, visual the text is. So, um, I think to push uh, what Prerna was asking, that what form of expressiveness you feel that, mm. say, prose can attain, or why it feels right to do something in prose, mm. um, or that you continued drawing in prose mm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had to struggle with the smells. We don't do smells as graphic novelists. Right, so that was something I had to struggle with when I did the, because I was like, there, there's stuff, you don't describe faces as graphic novelists. That's the first thing you learn. Oh, you can, like you can do anything, but you don't. You don't describe faces because you're there. And that's like, the, oh, that's really like some of what you begin like, uh, as, as that's like bad. Like you do not describe a face and then like, you know, also depict a face. So yes, so, so yes, there was some, like uh, some of it was fun. Like I knew where the challenge, and there were things I couldn't do and things I had to consciously like train myself to do with prose. So it was very much like once you're in it, it's, it was very much like, uh, I, I, I felt the tools. I, I could feel the transition between tools. That was very clear. There were things I could do, things I couldn't do, things I had absolutely like, just like, how do you do this? Because I didn't have that, because my hands didn't have that memory of that, uh, uh, you know, of that kind of writing or that kind of, or, or my eyes were not trained to see that stuff, you know, that kind of thing. So yes, I mean, I had a lot of fun. Uh, 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 and, uh, and again, uh, or maybe the word is pleasure. Like th there was, there's a pleasure to this too. Right? There's a pleasure to the exercise of craft. There's a pleasure to craft. And in both prose as well as I think uh, 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 drawing and illustration. Yeah.